There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Right, without sounding too much like an episode of The Simpsons, you'll probably know our, our, our guest this week from, uh, you may know him from, from this extraordinary trailblazing compilation, which actually invented the concept of retro in 1972. You may also know him from his many years as a guitar player with Patti Smith. But most recently, you can know him again via a new book called Lightning Striking Trans 10 transformative moments in rock and roll. Would you please welcome, if there was only an audience, <laughs> Lenny K. <laughs> Lenny yeah, K. The applause. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> great to see you. Very really good. And you're on the promotional. You're in London, aren't you? On the promotional. I am trail. in London. Yes. Well, look, the book is, is, yeah, 10 transformative moments in rock and roll. Give us some idea of the, the, the basic premise. I mean, it, it's particular moments in time and place that, that had a kind of a change the landscape, really, isn't it? That, that's pretty much it. Those locuses of energy and uh, that, that seemed to create a sea change. And it's kind of an evolutionary history of rock and roll. I mean, of course, it leaves out this and that and the other thing. But when, when I look at the uh, archaeological layers of the music that I celebrate there, I kind of looked at where things kind of shifted. The, the universe shifted and all of a sudden... Uh, it evolved. There, there was a new style, a new way of looking at the music that seemed to uh, render whatever happened before somewhat old-fashioned and pointed the way to the future. Whatever okay, well, look, we're, <laughs> we're going we're to go for three particular areas, we thought. Okay. We've, we've picked three, yes. It's just three. a random. <laughs> and the random. first one was the chapter in, because uh, it's just so interesting to, to hear your view of it as an outsider, but it's 1962. You talk mm -hmm. about Liverpool and you talk about England and obviously, you know, all the stuff, none of that stuff that happened before the Beatles would have been apparent in America, uh, right. particularly somebody your age, you know. And uh, sure. so what was your reaction when you found out about, you know, the stories of people like Larry Parnes and his stable, Tommy Steele and Johnny Gentle? And like, did it seem cartoonish and incredibly derivative of American rock and roll? Which it, was, it really. kind of I felt charming in a weird way. I mean, I, I actually love pre-Beatles English rock and roll. Uh, there, there's some aspect of the wannabe in it. There's some aspect of, of looking at themselves in a mirror and trying to be what this weird American music that's uh, kind of filtrating into, into Britain. And it's looking for identity. And to me, that's pretty much what these musical scenes are about. They're looking to form an identity uh, and they don't quite know what it is. And I especially like Liverpool in 62 because you have a kind of scene that's very removed from, from anything. I mean, Liverpool is up in the north. You know, it's not in the music business center. So it has a lot of time to kind of incubate and uh, stir its components. And it has a club to do that in and a, a distinctive sound. And it's somewhat apart until it bursts upon the world. And, you know, for me as uh, a, a young teenager in America, I do remember the impact that the Beatles had on, on myself as a, as a true fan of music, I guess, and, and how immediate was that impact and how it rendered everything before that, before. And, uh, you know, suddenly the, the channel was changed. And I, at the, at the wonderful age of 17, just 17, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was primed in the sweet spot to think, wow, I'd like to do that. I know three chords. I'm going to try to have a band, whatever. So that were, you, were you one of that generation? No, like I, I, I was totally. I mean, I learned, whatever. I, I learned my first guitar chords uh, a few months previously. I wanted to be a lonely folk singer in the backyard. <laughs> and, uh, but when the Beatles came, it was a whole perform. It wasn't even so much what they were playing, but 
it was a whole new breed of band, you know, previous yeah. the, band, the bands in my uh, hometown in New Jersey were kind of instrumental, like the Ventures, you know, uh, Johnny and the Hurricanes playing, you know, dance. And we were so in the Northeast that it wasn't like I had rockabilly bands to emulate or, or anything like that. I did want to be a, a, a second tenor in a doo-wop uh, singing group for a while, but... <laughs> But, you know, as soon as I started, my, my voice got kind of changed. <laughs> then all of a sudden I had the Beatles and, and you know, they were a band. They all sang. It wasn't like even a lead singer in front and some anonymous backing musician. So there, there was the model. And, I you know, I was certainly not alone. There were thousands of wannabe hope for musicians in America who got swept up in what the English invasion was about. And so by the end of 1964, I was in my first band, the Vandals. Was it, what, the Vandals, is that the, the name? Vandals, the bringing down the house with your kind of music. We played mostly <laughs> uh, fraternity uh, houses uh, on college campuses where our big moment was playing Shout for 20 minutes. Uh, and so the brothers could swim in beer on the floor. It was a great learning. I was actually trained in college for what I've now become, which, uh, you know, I was a, a student of uh, American cultural studies and, uh, and uh, you know, minored in having a rock band. And, gee, I'm still doing both. It's amazing. <laughs> the, the extraordinary thing about, about the Beatles in America is it, it's happened so suddenly, didn't they? Because they kind of came in at the top. They yeah. didn't slowly work their way up. Do you think no. we'll ever see anything quite as dramatically quick ever again? Or was there ever anything quite well, as quick? Well, you know, we did see Nirvana, so, you know, suddenly. I mean, there was a lot of paving of the way, and they had a whole different cultural landscape. But, you know, sometimes when these things – I mean, what about Elvis? When Elvis came along, suddenly everything before Elvis changed. You, you can see how these sea changes – operate it, it's a whole different performance uh style and and kind of uh you know it's like a meteor hits a certain uh era of music and wipes out all the dinosaurs and then you have a whole new uh mutation coming up and uh, I, I i it's how i chart history uh right. You know, I mean, uh, if, if, you know, you can look at the, uh, you know, it's like the Jurassic period, the uh, Precambrian, you know, the Mesozoic. Um, it, when the, 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 the different cities and times and places, I didn't have to hunt for them. They, they were there. There are a couple of places I wish I, I could have visited, but I had to make sure I finished the book uh, somewhere within uh, my lifetime. Uh, it just kind of grew like Topsy. I would have liked to have gone to Manchester perhaps in uh, the mid nineties and participated in the factory and the happy Mondays and stay out all night in the Hacienda uh, taking drugs, which I didn't get to do. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Can I ask hand, you about one person you mentioned in the chapter, which is Joe Meek. It's really interesting. You go on a little pilgrimage up to his place in Holloway yeah. road. Why was he so significant to you, for you? And, and was there an, was there an American equivalent really? Well, the American equivalent would be Phil Spector, I would say. People who were so maniac about sound and utilized the performers as components in their soundscape. Joe Meek, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm attracted to eccentric, slightly mad characters. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was certainly uh, a strange one, but also he helped lay the foundation for kind of breaking the British recording uh, industry into the future. You know, as, as we know, it used to be uh, you know, engineers in white coats and, you know, you can't really get into the red zone. That's so horrible. And mm -hmm. you don't really want to hear the bass drum because it's, you know, it disturbs whatever, you know, he really brought English recording into its present tense in, in early 1960. And, uh, I, I just, you know, he seems like a character that kind of bridged this very uh, saccharine teen idol thing and all of a sudden brought, even though his performers were teen idols, they, you know, he, he, he brought their, their surroundings into the future. Mm. I mean, I really think that he was important in, in, in making things sound like they were pushing against the speaker or something. Yeah. Very important for rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. 
let's move forward. So that's that's mm -hmm. 62, 63. Let's that's zoom like through. H.G. Wells. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yes, be wavy lines. This is a movie. There'll be wavy lines. on There'll be a wow. calendar flicking past. That's right. The so let's move, to, let's move to 1975. New good York. Year. I, I seem to remember uh, that year. Which you, absolutely, which you were very definitely at the centre of and a participant in. Amazing, right? Tell us what, why, why you, you know, what you wrote about that, what you, what you remember about that. Well, I, I remember more than perhaps uh, I should, but uh, it was amazing. You know, I was so in, influenced by the San Francisco scene, not only for the music and, and the thing, but the fact that it was like a beacon. Uh, when I had the Fillmore poster on my wall in New Jersey of uh, New Year's Eve from 1966 into 67 with the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Quicksilver Messenger Service, I realized that this was kind of a cauldron of imagination. And I, you know, I longed to be there. And, you know, of course, in 1967, I got into uh 56 ford with my buddy yes, larry you drove was, to the love end, didn't you that's right yeah, yeah we we just did we you know yeah. we, we just you know just kept at each each state had a new drug <laughs> and by the time we reached san Francisco, you know it was everything i'd hoped it was really a mecca for a new sound uh and at that point of course the new sound was on its way to becoming the cliche and the stereotype that all of these scenes actually become and become ready for the next transformation. Uh, but one, one day in 75, I'm standing outside of CBGB probably with Richard Lloyd, uh, gazing at the, uh, you know, the bums lying on the corner and, you know, dodging the bottles being thrown at us from the flop house up, up, upstairs. And I start thinking, wait a second, this combination of bands there seems to be an energy locus here. And, you know, it's that's about the time when it's starting to get picked up by the British papers, uh, that people are starting to recognize something's happening. But those two years before, when it was just the local bands playing for each other in probably the only rock club in town, that's when it all kind of congealed. It, 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 it was you know, kind of came together like this, um, uh, you know, space gas forms into uh, an actual solar system. So did New York, did, did New York have a characteristic that all those groups, do they all have some something in common that, that was what to do with the What they had in common, and this is what makes it This is Ramones, Patti Smith, Talking Heads, etc. Yeah. Yeah. What, what they had was a sensibility. All the groups were really different from each other. Tom Verlaine, uh, I, I, in a great quote, says each group was like a different idea. Um, but the sensibility was kind of oriented on this concept of punk, which didn't really have a style except for what would be the Ramones. Um, you know, it was just kind of an attitude more, more than anything. Uh, it, it was kind of, it was an umbrella for, for, a sense of otherness, you know, that, that you were, you were not part of this massive superstructure, even if you're in one of the music capitals, you're really subterranean. And, uh, you know, as, as the word punk became more known, and then of course, imported to England, where it, it achieved a very specific fashion style, musical style, and it was very hard to break out of that. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of great records, let's be honest, but to me, when musics figure themselves out so, so well that they can be defined, that's when it's time to move on. I, I, I like those moments when nobody really knows what's happening. It's like nuggets. I mean, oh, those mm. bands were dealing with a lot of, of, of artistic possibilities that were suddenly open to rock and roll bands. They didn't have to be just teen. They could aspire to whatever. And over the 60s, of course, they aspired so much that a room was made for, for a whole new crop of, of bands to kind of figure themselves out and move in the opposite direction. If everything was 10 minute songs, you know, they'll, the Ramones will take it back to a minute and a half and, you know, play seven songs in that 10 minutes. It's, it's a very reactive process. And I, I like that. I, I, I like because I like change. I, you know, once something gets figured out, you know, yeah. hey, let, let's let's, you know, move it on into the future. 
it's interesting uh, you touched on it there I mean with, with punk particularly that, that it was kind of it was a British emulation of an American idea that then it kind of went back and forth didn't it very very quickly at that point well you know same same with when the English invasion happened in America America took it and made it what we know now call the garage band you know it they, they wanted, you know, most of the American bands, you know, either did them or the Kinks or the Rolling Stones or the Beatles. You know, they had some elements of all these groups, but they started spinning it. And then it really spun into its own thing, whatever that thing is. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's better not to specify what it is. But, you know, garage bands became a thing. You, you had your yowling lead singer. You had your reedy Farfisa type organ. You had your fuzz tone guitars. You had the singer's attitude of, uh, you know, ah, 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 get my, yeah. and that kind of got underground when things became progressive. I, I, I love progressive rock. I like all rock. I mean, really just got to find the good ones. But to be, <clears throat> to be honest, it's like, then things got really larger than life. And so it's time to bring it down. And so the punk bands derived a lot of inspiration from the garage bands and melded it with this kind of spirit that was happening at CBGB. And so we have the great punk explosion of London in 1977. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a ping pong. I mean, I learned about yeah. Muddy Waters. Yeah. Not not from buying his chess records. I learned, you know, Muddy Waters song from from uh, the Rolling Stones. And then who is this Muddy Waters? And then, you know, it's, it's like sometimes you see things differently when you look in the mirror. I'll be your yeah. mirror. Reflect what you are in case you don't know. And, uh, you know, I, I think this this kind of give and take between two basically English language countries. So it's easy to meld the two it just it's a continuous uh exchange of uh may i say bodily fluids <laughs> it's uh you know what you like <laughs> but but it, it, it kind of interacts and uh i'm, I'm always a because i like when things blend i'm not a big fan of definitions uh, there's an album by the red crayola which i'm sure you have up in that that <laughs> pop of albums behind you and on the back of it mayo thompson says definitions define limit. And especially with Patty, we've always believed that we don't belong to any musical camp. In CBGBs, we were as much hippies as we were punks, as who knows what the heck we are. Um, but, you know, this is the way you give yourself room to evolve, grow, and and have a long lifeline. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I have no desire to be a part of, uh, you know, punk hits of the 70s or whatever, or, you know. So, so amazing description of the unsigned uh, 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 bands festival in 1975, you know, Blondie and Talking Heads and Ramones and stuff. I just wonder if there was any groups there at the time that, that you thought didn't achieve that kind of level of success and deserve to do a bit better. I, I, I always had affection for the shirts. I think Annie Golden was a, a really great singer and their, their songs were very complex. They didn't really belong to anything. I have some, uh, uh, affection for the Miamis, who to me had the catchiest song, We Deliver, 24 Hours a Day. <laughs> I can still sing it. Uh, but by then, the cream was starting to be skimmed. And, you know, we, we know the usual names. And most of them got record contracts um, and, you know, got to have their shot in, yeah. in the world. Mink DeVille, um, I think Mink DeVille was actually on that unsigned bands festival. And they, were. They, they had their own thing, which really had nothing to do with quote punk unquote. No, it's true. <laughs> I don't know. But on the other hand, you know, punk was still being defined even then they were unsigned bands. It wasn't like, you know, the Neo punk festival. I think punk, when I realized punk was like a very specific type of thing was when the dead boys moved uh, to uh, CBGB from Cleveland and, <laughs> and they were great. I mean, Steve Bader's was crazy. And uh, he once wrapped his uh, microphone cord around his neck so tightly that he passed out on stage. You know, gotta, gotta love that commitment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the extra mile, isn't it? Oh, so, yeah, totally. 
let's move and let's move to the third one the third uh scene that we we've okay. uh, selected out of your uh, out of your 10 in in the book which is seattle and again there's there's a similar kind of because i think i think Kurt cobain used to describe nirvana as a punk group didn't he that he, he was he was very influenced by the sex pistols from pretty near 20 sex, years sex earlier pistols, black flag i mean you know, he, you know, I think that was one of the reasons why he took so badly to becoming, a, you know, such a phenomenon. It wasn't even, it was a hit band. That was a phenomenon. And, you know, it's almost like his whole thing after they made that classic first record was trying to find a way out. Uh, but also the rock and roll lifestyle is quite an en enticement and you have to be very brave to, to kind of rebel against it, uh, you know, I mean, he part partook in the drugs part of sex, drugs, and rock, rock and roll. Um, you have to be aware, you know, I mean, with Patty, we've survived for a half century because really our focus is in the work. I, I've stayed out many a night dancing to White Wedding at 3.30, and I hope to <laughs> sometime again this week. But, <laughs> but the thing is that uh, really I... Uh, I, I, you know, we're about the work. We're about progression. We don't want to write songs that are our old songs sideways. Uh, you know, we just don't make albums for the sake of making albums. It's when we have something to say either to ourselves or, or to the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're about work. And, and I, you know, I, I know that especially in the, uh, metal chapter with the hair metal uh, you know this is like a music that's kind of catchy you must say but it's also built on appreciation of of the the uh, delights that are offered on a silver platter to rock stars and often you forget why you're playing music in the first place and uh you know, I make makes for great tales. The metal chapter is actually one of my favorites, especially the Norwegian one, which you got to think that yeah, that's about as crazy as it gets. It is, that is extraordinary because there's Norway with the highest kind of employment rates in the in the world, you know, and uh, enormous amounts of peace and prosperity. And of course, inevitably, it produces a, a a musical genre which is about burning down churches and all manner of uh, it's, very it's really insane. Moments. But, but as I keep reminding myself, the guy from Mayhem who was knifed to death by his bass player, you know, what did he do? He owned a record shop. He was, he was a guy who appreciated all those albums. You know, he just wishes there was a Voivod album under V's over there in the uh, <laughs> lower right-hand corner. <laughs> but, you know, they were music fans. It's just that sometimes you believe your own myths too much. And... To me, that's the danger. You have to realize that you're, you're not becoming the music. You are using the music to get outside yourself. You know, whatever conflictions and dissonances and, and, and weird emotions that you have to deal with, you know, that's why music and art was invented, to take it outside yourself so it doesn't kill you. And in both of those metal scenes, you know, and I like to bang my head as much as the next human, uh, you know, they they believed in their myth more than the healing power of their music. And uh, but it, it makes for a great story. <laughs> it's, it's really I, I I chuckled so much as I, I was reading it. And, uh, you know, thank God I wasn't living it. So your 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 book is about is about 10 things that took place in particular places, in particular right. times. Now, we're we're obviously nowadays in, you know, in the world of social media do you think you'll have those kind of scenes again in the future geographically located yes, you with can't imagine of... that there'll never be local music scenes because it's, it's well that, you know because the local music scenes need time all of these scenes had a couple of years to understand themselves without outside influence um you know surely seattle uh surely new york as i said you know that's what underground is about. Now, especially with the ease of everyone, you know, a band will do its first gig and then, you know, it, it'll be putting it all up on social media. So not only is it somewhat more self-conscious, but it's also like 
too soon. You, you need to toil away in obscurity for a while to understand who you are. I mean, it took the Patti Smith group, you know, three years to add a drummer. Um, you know, we weren't like all of a sudden, this is what we do. You know, you, you need that time to make your mistakes, to understand who you are and, and to gather about you. These scenes are not just the bands, uh, as Brian Eno's uh, descriptive is. They're about seniors. It's not individual genius. Yeah, yeah. It's about, you know, the, the people in the audience, the cultural moment. Uh, you know, I mean, would the Sex Pistols have been the Sex Pistols without the Bromley contingent? those people around them reflecting yeah. the music and, and creating a whole interplay. He calls it an, an ecology. And I really like that of, you know, those just, you know, there's curiosity seekers, there's people coming down thinking, man, I'm going to make a fortune out of this. Uh, there's the bands, there's the people dressing. So the bands want to dress like those people. Uh, it, it's a great little, you know, uh, what do they call it? Not stew, uh, stew pot. Is, anyway, you know, the, when you stir the whole uh, oh, right, melting yeah. pot, melting, melting pot. pot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and I like that. And sometimes they have to exist on their own. My suspicion, you know, because the book ends really pre pre email, you know, 1993. I don't think I got my first email until um, maybe 90, somewhere in that year, maybe 93. And I said, like, well, I'm getting it, something over the computer. <laughs> mm. Dial it up. But of course, you know, now the computer is everything. If you don't have a phone to get your QR code, you're done. So it's like, you know, technology has its own momentum. And I believe that probably the next scene will be these little pockets of, of the web where like-minded people gather and and understand each other doesn't it, it'll be kind of like uh, cyber geography i guess and uh i don't know i probably won't be participating in it it's, it's interesting <laughs> isn't it because so many it's, it's just so interesting because so many of the the things that you rise about in, in here are about people physically meeting aren't they you know what i mean they bump into each other and they recognize something about each other and uh, people uh, hanging out. I mean, that's to me, yeah. what, that's how you, that's how it goes. I mean, we can be talking, uh, uh, you know, over a computer or whatever, but it's not like you and me sitting no. at the bar shooting the breeze, you know, I mean, I spent as much time at CBGB standing outside, you know, talking to my friends, Seymour Stein, you know, whatever it is. Then I'd walk in and the Ramones would be fighting on stage and I'd walk out of, you know, cause I know they'd be back. I mean, People always say to me, you know, with a sense of wonder, what was it like? And they're always a little disappointed when I say it was just another night at the local. You know, I mean, you probably have one, too, in Peoria, Illinois, except we had some bands that gathered to their energies together. I mean, think about Athens, Georgia. I mean, there, there is a real, and I wanted to cover at one point to do a little chapter on Athens and Minneapolis. Oh, B-52s, great. Pylon, yeah, yeah, REM. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a really good scene clustered around, Yeah, uh, I think it was the Crocodile Club or I forget what the name of the club. Anyway, yeah, I thought that that's a really a good example of a very insular scene that's not a major capital. These scenes don't have to be major capitals. Um but, you know, if you have a bunch of people gathering and doing a bunch of stuff, that's kind of great. And, and I like to hang out. You know, in, in New York, I really seldom go up and see, uh, you know, the hotshot groups up at Madison Square Garden or whatever. I, I mostly go to see my friends play downtown. And that, that time in 1975, when my friends were playing downtown, all of a sudden, the lightning struck. It, it, it's funny when, when, you know, when you think about that, it's like all of a sudden that you're, you're where it's at and it's, it's kind of great. And I look on it very, you know, with a sense of bemusement, but I also know that really when I was down there and one of the six or seven top shelf groups were on the stage, you know, my idea, my, I'm sitting at the bar thinking, you know, geez, it's a really cute girl down there. 
maybe if I bought her a beer, you know, I'm here in the talk. But I'm not, you know, up in the front going, wow, I'm seeing something great. It's like, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just hanging out. And somebody comes over to me and, hey, you want to play the pinball machine? Okay, sure. So we have a little pinball excitement. It's, it's very, it's, it's weirdly normal. And then yeah. it moves into legend. Um, I assume Paris in 1920s was like that. Um, you know, I think Ernest Hemingway said something like, uh, uh, Paris, before it was a legend, that was, yeah. that was when it was Paris. Yes, And, sure. uh, you know, so, but now they're all legendary. Ten, yes. ten transformative moments. Done. There you are. Yeah. There you are. All done. Lightning striking by Lenny K. Lenny, it's been lovely to talk to you. Really Before great. you go, I've got to ask you one question because you've clearly got more records than I have, more records than everybody watching. Don't, don't bet on it. I, I, I'm really picky. Okay, well, I bet you've been Actually, really picking for really. quite a long time. I want to know, how do you file them? Alphabetical. Okay. Well, <laughs> my 45s are uh, really a mess. I have to say, I'm, I'm going to devote a week. Uh, I'm going to get some really kind bud, and I'm going to try to figure out the actual categories. My albums are not that bad. Um, you know, the major food groups, uh, there's a country section, a jazz section, a reggae <laughs> section. Food, food groups, um, great. Food group. <laughs> yeah, there's a pop section, which kind of spills over. There's an avant-garde section. I have a really nice collection of dance 12 inches, which uh, I indulge myself in all the time. But the section I really like is the wacko section, where you just have these records, you know, when you, get, you see them in the records, you, you buy them for the cover, you know, uh, and they're just like insane people. And I, I bought one because uh, I keep buying them. Uh, when I was in Amsterdam, I bought uh, the new album by Blackwater Holy Light, which is an all-female metal band on Riding Easy, who I have a, quite an affection for that label. They're the ones who do the Brown Acid series, which in my mind is the new nuggets. Um, but then I found, a, I was with uh, Lee Brackstone, who's uh, the uh, editor of, a white rabbit books and he, he was buying records like crazy i said that's my editor he's look at that he's <laughs> the records. yeah uh but we're looking through the prog rock section i don't often go there but a uh, kraut rock and uh he he takes out this um hungarian group i can't remember the name i haven't listened to the record they looked so nutty from 1978 and he says oh this is good this is uh kind of like soft prog and i thought well maybe i'll just take it home and put it you know i wish i i wish i had it here to show you but unfortunately i don't but uh you know i, I that's my weird section and it's mostly alphabetized so especially the, so, the, the so, you've got to so, know that something's in the wacko section and then once you're in the wacko section you find it alphabetically but i and, want you know to and often you know you you, you you pull it out and it's kind of you know i have a lot of those what are they called command records which are yeah. like you know the train going from here to there, and, and oh yeah, yeah. Or here's we have a we have a stereo system. Yes, absolutely. And uh, and um, you know it's just it's just it's so many records and so little. So time. so Captain Beefheart under C or B? Uh <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, I probably oh, see. Oh. Probably, C, okay. so probably C, uh, you know, Captain. I guess I don't think of Beefheart as his last name. And uh, and I start with uh, that album, uh, Safe as Milk, right on, yeah. uh, you know, and I have original copy. Thank you. With Absolutely. a sticker inside. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I bet you do. I bet you do. We'd love to come around and see it, Lenny. So maybe well, anytime, someday. you know, anytime you're in Northeast Pennsylvania, I'll open my door <laughs> to you and, uh, you know, we'll go we, straight we to the wacko section. Old, and actually, I love when people come over because most of the time I look at the records and I think, oh, what am I going to listen to? Sometimes I do that thing where you just kind of reach into it. Yeah, yeah. Something yeah, yeah, and you realize, yeah. Like I was actually I was thinking. Why don't you do that, David? Just reach back and get a record at random and let's see what This you is bound to be something really embarrassing in front of That's Lenny the best Kay. one. Right. There you go. It's the Rock Steady crew. <laughs> the yo, yo, yo. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's From great. When is that's the early 80s, isn't it? That's like a hip hop. Yeah. Don't, in that's hip -hop very good. That's very stop. cool. It is. It is. It is yeah. quite oddly cool, isn't it? It is that's extremely cool. I See, people wouldn't expect <laughs> you to own that, Dave. That's great. <laughs> and you'll be playing it tonight. Well, I will be playing it tonight. <laughs> Lenny, it's been, 
It's been lovely, lovely to talk to you. To really great Very to talk to you guys. It's great. wonderful. This has given me a real opportunity to hang with music fans, and it's, it's All wonderful. Right. I was on uh, Soho Radio this morning. We had a, a great chat. Uh, you know, Jason Pierce of uh, the Spaceman Three interviewed right, me right. yesterday. We've oh, just lovely. been on our own trips. It, it it's a. I love talking. I mean, that's what I like to spend my time. And you know, I go into the record store, and uh, whoever's standing next to me, you know, we start talking about records. And he says, "Man, have you heard this?" And I said, "No." And you heard this, and you know, I I like the social aspect. Uh, I once wrote a song called "Record Collector," because when I worked at Village Oldies, yeah. You know, all these people who really had no, they were kind of lonely people. I mean, I'm saying we're lonely, but you know, they had no place, but they really liked to come into the store once a week and buy their record and talk about it. You know, we, I didn't know their names. So this one was Mr. Beatles or, you know, Mr. Leslie Gore. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. but I, it really told me that what we are doing, we're in a social circle, you know, the, the record universe and uh, like a record, it goes round and round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I just like it. I like to go to, you know, these days I go to record flea markets and, uh, you know, I'll, I don't really need anything. I don't even want anything, but I'll just walk around and people will turn me on to this and, or I'll, you know, wind up in an odd, you know, genre and I'll say, wow, I, I really should collect square dance records. Of course, <laughs> yeah. I get home and I think, what did I do? What have I done? <laughs> yeah. Look,